Okay, so um, going back to our um, adult data, I'm just going to repeat that so that everybody remembers what I was talking about. Um, but in the one referent context, which is the context that you can see in this image over here, um, that supported the destination interpretation. So um, adult participants typically saw um, when they heard um, an ambiguous sentence, an ambiguous sentence, and saw this one referent context. They typically um, favored a destination interpretation of it, meaning that they took this frog and they would put it on this napkin, meaning put the frog on the napkin and then sometimes into the box. Um, what we saw in the two referent context is that adults were able to um, typically resolve the syntactic ambiguity here. Um, this supported the modifier interpretation because this um, allowed them to see two different frogs, one frog being on a napkin, one frog not being on a napkin. So um, the favorite interpretation was to put this frog that is on the napkin into this box up here. Um, what we saw in child data um, varied a little bit because children had trouble integrating their visual, the visual context. Um, the reason that we know this is because children did a lot of fun, um, different interesting things, um, but typically they um, saw the destination interpretation. Typically they would put the frog on the napkin, and this was in both contexts, both in the one referent context and the two referent context, telling us that they had trouble integrating this um, visual world, the visual context, into their interpretation of the sentence. So we use this study um, to think about how we wanted to think about um, bilingual um, syntactic ambiguity. Um, and so the focus of this study was syntactic ambiguity resolution in um, bilingual Spanish, English adults and children. Um, and so the different groups that were collected were 20 Spanish monolingual adults um, and 20 L1 um, Spanish or L1 English, L2 Spanish um, bilingual adults. Um, the eye movements were all recorded um, via an iLink 1000 um, using SR research. And so the preliminary findings that we found so far, um, what we did is we analyzed the proportion of um, fixations to the correct target. That meaning um, the box. So what we wanted to uh, the participants to interpret in that sentence was put the frog that is on the napkin into the box. Um, and so the correct destination or the correct target would be the box. Um, and so what we did is we separated um, target or we separated proportion of fixations into two different groups. We separated them into um, correct target um, fixations and incorrect. Um, which means any other thing that was in the visual um, context. So they could have been looking at the box, they could have been looking at another, or they could have been looking at, not the box, they could have been looking at another animal, but it wasn't what we wanted them to interpret um, the sentence as. And so the information that we've analyzed so far has to do with the uh, one referent context and the unambiguous control. And so here, that's what you can see. Um, and so what we found after analyzing the data for monolinguals, we saw um, that monolingual Spanish um, speakers actually um, are very similar to monolingual English speakers in the fact that here you can see this bar right here is showing us the percent of correct target fixations. We can see that that's less in ambiguous sentences than unambiguous sentences. And the meaning behind that is that participants in the, um, when they were seeing ambiguous sentences, um, what they were doing was looking um, to the correct destination, but also to an incorrect destination, which results in a little bit of a lower bar than for the unambiguous sentences. Um, so we see that they were having a little bit of trouble resolving that syntactic ambiguity as we were seeing in English monolingual participants. Um, when we started to look at bilingual participants, we found something that was quite unexpected in the fact that um, they um, seem to be resolving ambiguity at a much higher rate, or um, they had a, a much higher percent of correct target fixations. Um, and so um, this is unexpected because as we were seeing in the monolingual participants um, in English and in Spanish, ambiguity in the one referent context is hard um, for participants to resolve. So you would expect that to occur here as well. One of the reasons that we um, think that um, this could be based off of is a proficiency effect. Um, so what we were seeing is that possibly um, due to a low proficiency in Spanish or not a bilingual proficiency as, um, 
the bilingual proficiency that we were looking for, what could actually be happening is um, they are finding a mechanism to resolve the syntactic ambiguity in ambiguous sentences and in, in unambiguous sentences, and they're using the same mechanism. The reason behind that being that they may not be able to listen and understand each and every word in the sentence, so they may be looking for specific target words to understand and moving the objects accordingly in both the unambiguous sentences and the ambiguous sentences in the same way. Um, and so this data is important um, and something that we would like to continue to analyze to see um, if proficiency is actually what's causing this effect. Um, and so the next steps in this process, what we would like to do as I um, mentioned before is we really want to understand that language proficiency gap um, and understand why bilinguals were um, seeing such higher proportions of fixations to the correct target. Um, our next steps in the project are um, English monolingual data in the US. Um, and then we were thinking about collecting additional groups abroad. Um, I would like to go to Puerto Rico and I'm currently um, applying for a discovery grant. So hopefully that will um, allow me the opportunity to collect different groups in Puerto Rico. Um, we'd like to replicate these findings for Spanish monolinguals in Puerto Rico um, and look at Spanish English adults in English in Puerto Rico and Spanish English <coughs> bilingual children um, in English in Puerto Rico. And so another really um, important part of my trip was working with the schools. Um, so one of the important parts of um, Pyre 2 were um, transi or translational implications and thinking a little bit more about how we could bring this research to the general public. Um, and so um, I got to participate in a really cool um, experience where we got to go to several different schools, um, multilingual schools, mainly English in Granada. Um, and the whole reason that this project really started was um, the fact that it was prompted by questions from parents at these different schools about how bilingualism actually was affecting their child's development. Um, so this was a really cool way to actually bring some information about bilingualism to the schools um, to get kids thinking and maybe talk to their parents about some of the interesting things um, that happen in the bilingual brain. Um, so we visited two different multilingual public schools. The first was an elementary school by the name of Los Carmenes, and the second was a high school by the name of Francisco Ayala. Um, we worked with children from ages five to 16, and I have to say that they have the best English I've ever heard. It was really amazing. Um, I was really excited. Um, the teachers constantly had them speaking in English. Um, they kind of distributed their time between um, asking the kids to answer things in Spanish and asking the kids to um, to talk in um, English, which I thought was really helpful because it kind of helps them distinguish the two languages and they really think in English in school. Um, and essentially what we did is we had different presentations that just helped share um, the importance of bilingualism. We did a Stroop task with the, ch um, the kids were really interested in. And we talked a little bit about why bilingualism um, makes um, certain people better at um, tasks such as those. Um, we also showed them a little bit of a, um, a little bit about our research here at Penn State, and they got to see um, an image of a brain, which they were really excited about. Um, and it was an interactive website where they got to see what each part of the brain does. Um, and it was really neat because I think we were met by a really receptive group of kids. They were really excited. They had a lot of questions. They um, they wanted to talk um, about all different kinds of things. Um, and so this was a really cool experience and a way that we could actually bring research to the people that need it. And so talking about some of the other learning outcomes um, while I was abroad, um, this was a really great experience because it was a um, hands-on experience with research. Um, before I left, I did a, a lot of preparation. I had worked in a lab, but I really hadn't worked with my own study before. I didn't really know how to um, run participants as I did in the US, it was a little bit different because I was explaining everything um, in Spanish or um, a lot of different things were going on. And so this was a really cool way to kind of jump right into research. They say that the best way to learn a language is to speak it, to live in it. And I think that's the same with research. The best way to learn research is to do it, um, to be fully immersed in it. And this is what really allowed me to do this. Um, I also learned a ton about the value of collaboration. So throughout this whole project, um, I collaborated with a lot of different people, both here and in Granada. And I also collaborated with several um, grad students, which was a really cool experience. Um, what's cool about working with grad students is there's like a lot of mentoring. They can help you 
um, with your dumb questions that you may not want to ask your advisor um, <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Um, and then working with um, professors who um, are really established in research was a really, really cool experience. It's amazing to see um, how much people know and learn about those different kinds of things. Um, and then it was also really cool to collaborate pe uh, with people from different parts of the world. Um, and we found out um, that people do research a little bit differently in different parts of the world, which was neat as well. Um, and so that's really valuable in the fact that we may not like exactly how everything goes, but um, it's cool to see a different perspective. And it made me think about how I want to live my life and how I want to do research and um, those kinds of things as well. Um, and another one of the learning outcomes, um, I hope to go to medical school someday. Um, and, um, what I found interesting about this experience is um, I'm really passionate about um, Spanish, and so I really wanted to integrate that somehow into my career. Um, and so I would like to work with um, under-resourced um, groups, Spanish-speaking groups in the United States. And what I found interesting about this experience is it taught me a little bit about um, the different cultures that you can find in such a small space. I lived in Barcelona for about two years, so I kind of thought, what, going in, I kind of thought I knew like everything about um, Spain. And I was really fascinated. I'd never really been to the south of Spain, um, and I found a really different culture um, that was really grand. Um, it was kind of cool to work with different people to see how there really are differences in culture um, in such a small region. <laughs> Um, so I found that interesting as well, and I hope to um, somehow integrate that into my knowledge about um, different populations of um, Spanish speakers in the U.S. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who's been involved in this process, um, all of the um, principal investigators, the undergraduate evaluation committee, um, the Center for Language Science, obviously, and then um, uh, Miriam and Heather, thank you so much for putting up with my late emails and my, but they have been so amazing through this process and I really can't thank you enough because you guys are really the basis for um, getting people abroad and helping us with all of these different factors. So thank you so much. So if anybody has any burning questions that they want to ask now? I have one. Can I okay. have one? Yeah. Um, you mentioned something about how good the children's uh, competence in English was. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about their competence in Spanish, given that this is what the parents were worried about? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the children, when we would like watch them in the hallways, they were Spanish speakers. So they would typically, um, they were talking with each other in Spanish. Um, and so they had just as high of a level of Spanish. Um, and I know that they've done research at that school, with those two schools specifically, um, in Granada. Um, and so I know that um, they were finding that um, the kids have very high proficiencies in both Spanish and in English, and they also have um, a whole host of um, different um, places in which they excel over other schools in the area. So um, that's pretty neat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.